Good morning and welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Congregation. To those of you in person and those of you at home, welcome. My name is Bernadine Cataletta and I will be your speaker this morning. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of each person. And we think climate change is real, that women's rights are human rights, that all black lives matter, and that all genders are good and holy. And we Unitarians stand on the side of love. Each Sunday, we pause to light candles of acknowledgement and remembrance. We light a candle in recognition of the Cherokee and Muscogee nations, of people who lived on this land for centuries. And we light a candle in remembrance of the Africans who were enslaved on or near this land and in this county. We acknowledge the suffering and destruction caused by the acts of violence that were perpetrated against them. And we commit ourselves to being a people who will not allow such atrocities to continue. May there be healing in all nations of people. Now Mike Myers will light our chalice. Good morning. Good morning. And my name is Michael Myers, and I am the chairman of the uh, building IT, uh, member of the choir when we're actually in full session, and a, a uh, worship associate, which is why I'm here this morning. Each Sunday, we also light our chalice. Its light is a symbol of Unitarian Universalism and a reminder of our commitment to be a beacon of love and hope in the world. Today's chalice lighting words are, fire consumes and casts a bright light. May our chalice flame consume our regrets for the past, our fears about the future, and our worries about today. May it light, our, light for us a path of joy and peace. Now in the spirit of beloved community, let's greet and welcome each other to worship as we share our congregational affirmation we need not think alike to love alike. Those in the sanctuary, feel free to move around and offer greetings to others. For those online, please use the chat to introduce yourself and unmute and say hello. Our opening hymn this morning is number 131 in the gray hymnal. Again, number 131. Please rise as you are able. If not, have a seat and enjoy the music.
Good morning, sisters, brothers, and siblings. I'm Susan Ullman, and I serve as a member of our Emerson Pastoral Care Team. When you come here before the service, you can light a candle of care right over there on the table to acknowledge and honor what is in your heart. And at home, I encourage you, if there's a candle nearby to light, put it nearby and light it, and acknowledge what's on your heart from wherever you are out there. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on and share joys, sorrows, and concerns in our lives. I invite you to use this moment of pause to take a deep breath. Notice what is on your heart today. Are there joys enlivening your spirit? Perhaps there are sorrows or concerns you carry with you today. Allow this time, time to give thanks and give them space, to hold them with gentleness and compassion. Take another deep breath in and out as Michael Myers lights our candles of care, including the large white vigil candle that acknowledges our troops deployed all over the world. Its light represents the light of hope for peaceful resolution of all conflicts on our planet, and it honors all the dedicated people who serve, especially this July 4th weekend. Allow yourself to receive a joy from our community, from Susan and Joe Tomacek. Our grandkids and their mom arrived in Atlanta from California. We're going out for lunch today. Boy, have they grown. And after the service, you're welcome to come see the picture he sent me to see the evidence that they have really grown. This morning, I don't have a sorrow concern that I can read. But please, allow your heart to open even more than it is, knowing that there may be joys, sorrows, and concerns not spoken. Please feel free to say out loud or to type in the chat, if you're online, the name of someone you're holding dearly in your heart today. John Fehrenbach and Thomas Arnoldison. Now let us sit in silence for a moment, allowing ourselves to feel part of this community of care. And lastly, let's send our heartfelt, caring intentions to all beings everywhere and to ourselves by offering the Buddhist prayer of loving kindness. Please repeat the words after me. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we all be free from harm and suffering. May we all be free from harm and suffering. May we all be well in body, heart, and mind. May we all be well in body, heart, and mind. May we all be at peace. And may we all be at peace. Blessed be. One way we seek to live our lives, our life values, is by partnering with other organizations who work to bring love, kindness, and justice to the world. We encourage our members and friends to support our work financially as we share our weekly collection and also by encouraging by direct action. This month, we are partnering with Life Safe Resources. Life Safe is located in Marietta and is committed to providing safety and healing to those impacted by domestic violence, sexual assault, and elder abuse by offering housing, educational programs, and consulting. They work to create awareness and foster support within the community, 
They work with women and men and children, regardless of sexual orientation, gender, or gender identity, religion, race, or ethnicity, who have been affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, or elder abuse. A link to give it to, to a link to ways to give is posted in the chat. For those in the sanctuary as the basket is passed, please feel free to offer a donation or to take a card which describes the ways to give. So my name is Jillian Scow, and I have a story for all ages, so I want to invite the children to come sit up here, and we're going to share a story. Probably you'll be able to see the pictures better if you sit up front. Welcome, welcome. So this story is called, Sometimes You Fly. And it is actually written as a poem by Catherine Applegate. And the illustrations are by Jennifer Black Reinhardt. Before the Cake. Hold the mic for me and I'll hold the paper book. All right, thank you. Before the peas. So here's the before. That's the after. Before the laugh. Ooh, he's not very happy. But now he is. Before the seas. Before the blocks. What's she going to do with those blocks? Ooh, pretty impressive building. Before the grow, oh no, he's too short to ride. But now, he's on a roller coaster. Before the friend, he looks lonely. Ooh, now he's got a bestie. Before the no, this poor kid's confused, but now, Ooh, she's got it. Before the team. I don't have a team. No, lots of practice. Oh, now she's on the team. Before the ride. Beware, student driver. Oh, but now she's good. Before the heart. Before the pride. Lots of late nights. For the high school graduate. Each recipe we undertake can rise or fall, can burn or bake. Anybody ever tried to make something that burned? Mm, it happens. But when we break, we learn to mend. And when breeze blows, we learn to bend. Remember then, with every try, sometimes you fail. Yep, everybody in the dance line is facing one way and she's in the other direction. It happens. Sometimes you fly. 
What matters most is what you take from all you learn before the cake. <laughs> so we make a lot of burned lopsided cakes before we get that one, but that's totally fine. Just keep trying, guys. All right, let's sing our song of dedication. Stand up with me. Thank you, Bruce. That was beautiful.
<clears throat> I have a nagging regret that I wasn't always a good mother. For example, I forced our three young daughters to attend religious school every Saturday morning for three years. They had to give up sleeping late and having fun on their day off. The religious classes went from 9 a.m. to noon every Saturday during the school year. <clears throat> and what made it worse, and this is my regret, <clears throat> that I was having serious doubts about the very religion that I was expected our daughters to absorb. I hadn't attended mass anymore, and I was struggling to reconcile this religion of my youth to my adult questioning of dogma. So when the, relig so when the Saturday religion teacher asked the students, who went to mass with their parents last Sunday? My kids were the only ones with their hands on their laps. Yes, I do regret making them learn about a religion I no longer believed in. And here's another example of a nagging regret that I have. A regret that I wasn't a good enough daughter. When my mother was 93 years old, she was living with a full-time care worker at a retirement center in the Chicago area. She loved it. When I would come and visit her, I'd be coming in from North Carolina, where I lived at the time, to visit and to take her to her favorite place, the grocery store. In her younger days, my mom was a terrific cook. At the grocery store, she was an expert at picking out just the freshest and most nutritious foods. She could spot the freshest cabbage for her guwumki, just the right brand of sauerkraut for her pierogi. In her younger days, she was an efficient and savvy shopper. So when I made the 13-hour trip to visit her in Chicago, she would always ask to go to the grocery store, even though she didn't cook anymore. I thought it was strange. At the grocery store, though, she would zero in and pick up the reddest, roundest tomato and become deep in thought. She would just dwell on that tomato, almost like a meditation. Fifteen seconds later, I'd say, Mom, are you going to buy that tomato? No, she would say, I'm just looking. OK, Mom, we have to keep moving. It's getting late. But she'd continue to observe the oranges and the apples in the same way. I'd look at my watch and say, Mom, we've got to get moving. It's getting late. I regret not giving her the time to really enjoy her shopping trip and the moments when she just wanted to reminisce and enjoy the beauty of the produce. I'm sure every one of us has regrets, yet every morning, every day, we leave our houses and we decide what we'll bring with us in our virtual backpacks. Just what will we carry out of the doors and onto our shoulders? How much integrity? How much compassion? How much anger? How many regrets? We pack these with our lunch and our date book. Yes, some of us still use date books. But it's especially the regrets that weigh us down. We walk out the door wearing our history, including our regrets. It's comforting in a way to know that everyone has regrets. The experts say that it's a universal occurrence. We all have our moments that we wished never had happened, things we have done or not done, and now we regret. 
That heaviness that we carry on our shoulders can weigh us down and even influence our actions for a day, a week, lifetime. To make peace with our past and live a fuller, happier life, I invite you to look at what regrets are all about and let's ask ourselves, why do we carry the baggage of the past around with us? How does regret affect our lives? And how do we lighten our backpacks? How do we take regrets out of our virtual backpacks? So let's take a look at it. Regret is a feeling of disappointment over the wish that something we did or did not do, something we said or did not say in the past that could have been different. The language of regret goes like this. I wish I coulda, woulda, shoulda. It often comes with a kind of helplessness because we cannot change the past and we do not know what to do with this feeling of dissatisfaction in the present. We all carry around a lot of negativity in our backpacks. It's the result of unmet expectations, losses, failures, lost loves, frustrated ambitions, and it could even be the critical words of many teachers or religious leaders gnawing at our hearts still. It's the wishful thinking that the future might have been different if only we had made a different choice in the past. So why then do we carry this baggage of the past with us? Those who study regret <clears throat> note that regret occurs virtually among all ages and cultures. Dr. Neil Rose, a psychology professor at Northwestern University, says this about regret. It's just the way our brains work. We humans have the ability to imagine different outcomes. Therefore, humans, unlike animals, have regrets. How does it affect our lives? Professor Kim Penn, a behavioral scientist at the University of Virginia says, if regret lingers without some sort of resolution, it can stop us from moving forward with our lives. She goes on to say that regret may lead to a bias in one's decision making that can result in making poor life choices. It's the actions that we choose based on the emotion of regret that can make a difference in our long-term well-being. For me, it's my feeling that I wasn't a good enough mother and I wasn't a good enough daughter. Regrets like these lower my self-esteem and my self-confidence. So how do we take regrets out of our backpacks? As with other negative emotions, it doesn't work to avoid, deny, or try to squash our regrets. In the long run, these tactics only prolong the time we suffer with them. Rather than stay stuck, we can manage these emotions first by showing self-compassion and forgiving ourselves. Showing a compassion to ourselves means reminding ourselves that we are only human. We try to do the best we can, and sometimes we just don't live up to our ideal self. If we can forgive ourselves for just being human and making mistakes, we can move on to a better self-concept. By facing our humanness and having the courage to admit, admit that we were wrong, asking for forgiveness from others, and then forgiving ourselves, we can take the sting out of regret and move on. <clears throat> 
They say that the study of regrets should be called anthropology. For example, I asked myself, why did I force my daughters to attend religious school while at the same time I myself was questioning the very dogma that they were being forced to learn? I've thought a lot about it, and in truth, at that time, I didn't know what the right thing to do. I was having real doubts about this religion of my youth, but I felt it was my duty as a parent to provide my children with a religious background. I felt I couldn't deprive my children of religion, even though I was questioning the very religion. In order to get past this regret that I felt over the years, I decided to face my blunder and ask my daughters directly to forgive my mistake. I told them that I was so confused at that time about religion, and now I wish I had made a different decision and not have forced the religious school on them. I apologized to my daughters and explained the conundrum that I was in at that time. Of course, they forgave me, and we did come to a mutual understanding and a deeper love. I can now look back at my I shoulda, coulda, woulda with more understanding and compassion for myself. I still remember the experience, but now without the guilt and sadness. I accept the fact that I'm not perfect. Every single person on earth makes mistakes and that's how we learn and grow. Another way to take regrets out of our backpack is by understanding that our circumstances in life at that time often influence our decisions. It's the ability to recognize and to understand that we made decisions based on the values and the information that we had at that time. For example, let's take the story I told you in the beginning about the impatience with my mother at the grocery store. I see now that we were at two different stages in our lives. My mom had all the time in the world to enjoy an outing where she could spend time enjoying the moment, absorbing the beauty of the redness of a tomato or the curves and shine of a delicious apple. She had the time to reminisce. However, at that time, I was in a totally different stage in my life. I was busy. I had a full-time job, family responsibilities, the challenges of traveling from North Carolina to Chicago, how I wish I could have appreciated where she was in her life. Of course, my mom has been gone for a number of years now, and I can no longer talk to her and say, I'm sorry for rushing you, for not appreciating what you are feeling. But for me, just the realization that now I understand we were at two different stages in our lives and how I wish I had a more gracious understanding and different attitude at the time. This realization has made me less sad about this regret. I still remember the time, but I remind myself that the circumstances in life often get in the way of making better decisions. And so when we can accept that by our very humanness, and that because we are cognitive creatures, we will always have regrets. We will always imagine that it could have been different if only. But it's important for us to realize that sometimes these regrets can hold us back from developing into the whole beautiful people that we are. In order to evolve and develop, as individuals, we need to resolve our regrets. We need to lighten our load by taking the regrets out of our backpacks. 
When we can ask forgiveness from others and then forgive ourselves and show compassion to ourselves, then can we take the sting out of our regrets. We can overcome our regrets when we accept that our circumstances in life often create situations where it's impossible to have known the right course of action at the time. We grow emotionally and spiritually when we face our regrets. Making peace with our past is a way to living fully in the present. Someone once said, life is not about perfection, but about evolution. The fact is that we are all human, that we make mistakes, but we are ready to grow and evolve. We need to experience this life, and that means both the good and the bad. Accept the challenges life offers as lessons that we need in order to grow. Forgive ourselves for the past, accept it, and start living a fuller life. Quiet, the peace, the time to reflect. I invite you to gently close your eyes or soft eyes and begin to listen and feel your breath. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, hold, breathe out. Breathe in, hold, breathe out. Feel the quiet, feel the peace. Be present wherever you are in life and listen to the wind singing in your veins. Feel the love, the longing, the fear in your bones. Open your heart to who you are right now, not who you would like to be, not the saint you are striving to become. All of you is holy. You already are more than what you can know. Breathe in, breathe out. Touch in, let go. And now open your eyes and let's rise as you are able and sing the first verse of our closing hymn, number 311, Let It Be a Dance. Number 311, Let It Be a Dance.
Jesus plant the seed. Let it be a dance. The great courageous act that we must all do is to have the courage to step out of our history and out of our past so that we can start living our dreams right now. We hope you've been nourished in heart and mind by our worship today. If you'd like more information about Unitarian Universalism or about participation at Emerson, please stop by our welcome table just outside in the front entry. Peggy Gastrite is there this morning to greet you. As our chalice is extinguished this morning, please join me in the final words. We extinguish this chalice, but not the truth of light, uh, not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until, until we are together again. again. I'm just quicker than burning, that's all. <laughs> Please join us for refreshments and fellowship in our fellowship room uh, directly behind me on the first floor in the, near the back doors. At 11 and 15, we offer religious education and exploration for children, youth, and adults. Our services are now concluded, but our connection has only begun. Bernadine will be at the service reflections right after the, uh, in the sanctuary at 11.15. Go now in peace and take peace wherever you go. The service is ended.